Welcome to all of you who are here with us this morning and welcome to all those that are joining us via live stream. Welcome to All Saints Church. If you are new to All Saints or if you're visiting with us this morning uh, and would like to keep apprised of our future events and other things of interest to you here, there are green contact sheets near both doors. So please take a moment to give us your contact information. That way we can get you on our e-blast list. There's also a welcome table on the lawn where you can pick up a red welcome bag, which includes a welcome card to take with you to fill out and then return to us, or you can fill it out there on the spot. We're really, really glad you're here and we um, hope that you get to know us more. Each week we put our faith into action and this week we are working in conjunction with Bread for the World. Uh, we are joining thousands of other churches around the country in writing letters to Congress asking them to make funding decisions that put our country and the world on track to end hunger. Congress is currently threatening to eliminate domestic programs that feed children and the elderly and eliminate foreign aid programs at a time when famine threatens over 20 million people in Africa. We need our California senators and representatives to be champions of the most vulnerable among us. So please take a moment to stop by the action table out on the lawn and sign letters to Senator Feinstein, Senator Harris, and your member of the House. Also this week, we are collecting monetary gifts above and beyond your pledge contributions to establish an emergency fund for local individuals and families impacted by the unjust immigration enforcement and detention policies of our government. This connects us to the wider Pasadena Sanctuary Sabbath weekend at various local faith communities seeking to provide awareness and education on these issues. Finally, it is your generosity that makes the big difference here. Please consider making a pledge to All Saints Church so we continue to spread justice and healing in the community, nation, and our world. Now, it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce to you Tim Wise, our speaker for this morning. And we are so delighted to have him. Tim is among the nation's most prominent anti-racism activists, educators, and writers. He has spent 25 years speaking to audiences in all 50 states, on over 1,000 college and high school campuses, at hundreds of professional and academic conferences, and to community groups across the nation just like ours. He has also lectured internationally and has trained corporate, government, law enforcement, and medical industry professionals on methods for dismantling racism in their institutions. Wise's anti-racism work traces back to his days as a college activist in the 1980s, fighting for divestment from and economic sanctions against apartheid in South Africa. After his graduation, he threw himself into social justice efforts full time. He became a community organizer in New Orleans public housing, a policy analyst for children's advocacy group focused on combating poverty and economic inequality. He served as an adjunct professor and was also an advisor to the Fisk University Race Relations Institute in Nashville, Tennessee. He is the author of seven books, including his highly acclaimed memoir, White Like Me, Reflections on Race from a Privileged Son, as well as Dear White America, Letter to a New Minority, and his latest, Under the Influence, Shaming the Poor, Praising the Rich, and Sacrificing the Future of America. These books are available over here um, if you're interested in purchasing one. And a new update on Tim, which really interests me. He is also one of five persons, including President Barack Obama, interviewed for the video exhibition on race relations in America, featured at the newly opened National Museum of the African American History and Culture in Washington, DC. Congrats. That's a huge honor. So join me in welcoming Tim Wise. I didn't know whether to put that piece in the bio, to be perfectly honest, because, well, because it could be perceived as like, oh, there's another white guy gentrifying black space again, you know, showing up in the African American History Museum where he doesn't really belong. So I was sort of like, no, and then they said, but the director wanted me to be in it, so I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it. And then if uh, I get pushed back, I'll point them at the director and they can <laughs> take, it up with, take it up with Lonnie Bunch. Um, anyway, thank you so much for being here. It is good to be back. Uh, it's been almost exactly one year, I think maybe 
um, year and maybe two or three months since I was here before. Um, I don't know if you know, some stuff changed in the country. Uh, <laughs> God, it was a weird 15 months, I, you know? When I was here before, I was like, you know, I remember Donald Trump had said something and I was like, but I'm not gonna dwell much on this because I don't really have to. And guess I should have dwelled on it a little more. Um, so here's the thing I think you know about me if you've heard me speak before, if you've read my stuff. I am not known for my optimism. Um, you know, like, I mean, I'm not an overly pessimistic person either, but I'm not known for my optimism. I'm not cynical but I'm not known for my optimism. So um, what I'm about to say may seem strange. I try, I, it's because I got teenagers, 15 and 13 year old girls, and I'm trying before they leave my home to, to instill in them some hope and some optimistic outlook. So I'm trying to tease a silver lining from the incredibly dangerous storm clouds that I think we can probably most of us see and understand and feel in this country. And I don't even know if I've convinced myself of this silver lining yet, but I'm gonna try it out on you. And we're gonna, and you may not buy it either, because I don't know if I can sell it, right? But, but, but here's the thing, like, for the last eight years, those of us who do this work, myself very much included, we have had to go around this country and convince people that racism was still a thing. Like, for eight years, that was sort of the subtext of our job. That was our job description. Like, no, really, it's still a thing. And we didn't have to convince people of color of this, but white folks sometimes need a little coaxing. You know, it takes us, we're sort of slow on that stuff. So we've had to be working really hard to convince white folks that these kind of discussions or, you know, this kind of stuff was even necessary. So here's the silver lining in the current situation. Yeah, I don't have to do that work anymore, right? <laughs> I mean, there's something to be, see, I don't, did I sell it or is it just, it was sort of cynical, but like funny cynical, right? Um, I don't really have to pull teeth anymore because I think we sort of get it now increasingly, or at least some do, not all, right? It's sort of like, and I know sports analogies are way overused, but I'm from the South, so you're going to have to indulge me for a minute. Um, it's sort of like back in the day, and if you've always lived on the West Coast, you may not know this, but those of us who live in the Central or the Eastern time zone, on Sundays when CBS was the only network that showed NFL football, right? They had the, in the, in the South, it was the noon game and the, and the three game. And the three o'clock game would always bleed over into what? 60 minutes, right? It would bleed. Now, if you're on the West Coast, you got to see it in real time because they were starting the games at, you know, eight o'clock or five in the morning or whatever they were starting them out here. But for us, the three o'clock game would always get over around 6.15, all right? And then the announcer would break in uh, like a little voiceover and they would say, now back to your regularly scheduled programming. That's sort of what the election of Donald Trump is, y'all. And I need you to understand, it is back to your regularly scheduled programming. All this other stuff for eight years, that was like D.L. Hughley said this better than I did. He said it's sort of like going to a Broadway show and that's the intermission, right? And then the intermission's over and it's like, back to the show, right? And the reason it's important for me to say this is I think in the last several months, people have been paralyzed by this fear, understandable, but a fear that is rooted at least in part in the idea that this is a really new deviation, right? That this is some new, uniquely dangerous moment in American history, right? And one of the things that I do want to say that perhaps, I don't know if it's optimistic or just trying to put things in perspective, right, is that one thing this is not is new, right? And the reason that's important to understand is if you think the monster in the room is one you've never seen before, right? You don't have any idea how to respond to it. You don't know how to fight it. It knocks you off balance precisely because you're trying so hard to just decipher what it is. But I want to suggest to you that the monster that stalks the country, which by the way is not a man, it's a movement, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ideology, it's not Trump, it's Trumpism, that there's nothing really new about it and take heart in that because if the monster isn't new, then our resistance doesn't have to be all that different. We just gotta keep doing what folks have been doing, the very people who are chronicled in that museum that I'm honored to be a part of in that video because they know how to fight monsters and they've always fought monsters and I'm fairly confident that if Bull Connor could not lay black and brown folks low, if Jim Clark in Selma could not lay black and brown folks low, if Lester Maddox in Georgia could not lay black and brown folks low that Donald John Trump ain't going to be the one, y'all. So just know that.
So let's understand Trumpism, and first let's dispense with some of the nonsense, right? Because there are still a lot of people who would have us believe that everything I just said, however much it might be pretty rhetorically, that it isn't really fair because after all, it's not right of me to suggest that Trumpism is first and foremost a white nationalist project. That it's not, oh, I hadn't said that yet, but I just did. Um, <laughs> But that's not fair, Tim, because you know these are folks who are first and foremost motivated by their economic anxiety. Here's how we know that that isn't true. Right? First, we know it's not true because if Trumpism were rooted mostly in economic anxiety, black and brown folks would have been lined up around the block to vote for him, right? <laughs> because when it comes to economic anxiety, people of color are the ones who always both quantitatively and qualitatively have a disproportionate share of it. African-American folks, even who have a college degree, almost twice as likely as whites with a degree to be unemployed, regardless of major, by the way. Latino and Latina folks with a college degree, 50% more likely than whites with a degree to be out of work, regardless of major. Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders with a degree, 23% more likely than whites with a degree to be out of work, our indigenous brothers and sisters, two thirds more likely to be unemployed even when they have a degree relative to white folks. So if economic anxiety were the principal driver, this would have been a multicultural, multiracial movement unprecedented in the history of America and I think it is safe to say that that is not what we saw. That isn't to say economic anxiety isn't in the picture though. Right? See, this is the mistake we make in this country, I think sometimes when we talk about class and race as separate phenomena, that we ignore that yes, it was about economic anxiety, but only in relation to a backdrop of white supremacy and privilege. And what I mean by that is that white identity for hundreds of years, going back to the colonial period, has been about the connection symbolically of whiteness to a form of caste superiority even when one's class position was wanting and lacking, right? In other words, it was the way to tell even the poorest white person that you're better than even the best off person who isn't designated as white. It was what W.E.B. Du Bois would later call the psychological wage of whiteness. And that is the coin of the realm in this culture and has been for a very long time, especially if you're suffering, right? Because if you're rich, this is redundant, right? This skin, this is redundant. For Donald Trump, this is redundant, right? For Bill Gates, this is redundant. For anyone who has a whole lot of money, right? For those 38 people in this country who have the same net worth as the bottom half, because those are the numbers, by the way, this is redundant. But for the poor, white, Appalachian coal miner or assembly line worker in Pennsylvania, this is often all they got, and they will cash that check because this culture has told them that it has value, so that's our dilemma. It isn't that they don't suffer economic anxiety, it's that they suffer it and by God, they weren't supposed to have to, right? There's this thing called expectationalism, which I don't know if it's a thing, but it's a word. I, maybe I made it up, I don't know, I like it. Um, <laughs> And one of the privileges and perks, I suppose, of being a white male is I can just make up words and get away with it. <laughs> so I'm gonna use that when it serves a, a positive function, right? Um, expectationalism, right, says to white folks, you are supposed to have the best of everything, but even if you don't, you'll at least always have this. So it isn't really shocking when a candidate for office would play on that. That's why I'm saying it's not new. It's not new at all. It's been around for a very long time. So it is about economic anxiety, but only against a backdrop of, of racial supremacy. Trumpism is predicated on a few things in particular that we've seen before. The first is, of course, nostalgia. It is, first and foremost, a nostalgic movement, right? That's why the hat says, make America great again, right? It doesn't say, let's make America great for the first time because we really haven't ever gotten it right before, not only because that won't fit on the hat, <laughs> but because the people who crafted the slogan wanted to appeal, much like the Tea Party did before them, to a nostalgic past. And I know a little something about nostalgia because like I said, I'm from the South and we do that with grits. Like that is what we do, right? I mean, we had that song, you've heard the song, right? Uh, Wish I were in the land of cotton. Old times there are not forgotten. Look away, look away, look away, Dixieland. And if y'all think the South lost the Civil War, you haven't been paying attention. 
just telling you the truth. See, sometimes victories take a really long time to manifest and materialize and folks go to sleep. But that's what we do. We do nostalgia. And the whole nation under Trumpism is gripped by that, the notion that once upon a time we were great. Now, they'll never tell you when you ask them when, right? Because I do that because I'm pushy that way and obnoxious. And I'll say, well, when, you know, when was it great? And they always are like, well, you know, because they know any answer they give makes them sound like a jerk, right? They can't give a good answer that's going to, they can't say the 50s because then they're going to be like, oh, yeah, wait, you know. They can't say the 19... 19- 11 like teens or something because children are working in mines and factories they know that sounds terrible but you know in a way that's what they're thinking right that we want to go back to this age of supposed innocence when everything was wonderful and so nostalgia makes up a big piece of it and that's nothing new the second thing trumpism is predicated on is a backlash to real or at least perceived gains but often real gains made by people of color if you want to understand what's going on in this country it's one thing to come and listen to me, and I'm glad you're here, and I'm totally going to sell you books in a minute, so that's, that's my subliminal. I'm, I'm a slick salesman like that. I just put it out there for you. Um, but uh, read mine for sure, but please read Carol Anderson's book. Carol Anderson, a brilliant scholar at Emory University, um, who wrote this book, White Rage, that came out about a year ago, maybe 15 months ago. It's a brilliant book. Because what she talks about, and she does it in like only like 148 or 172 pages or something, very quick, very brief, to the point, talking about how every single iteration of progress, specifically for black folks, but I think you can make the same analysis for peoples of color generally, every diminution of whiteness as power, every advance was met, not just with the term backlash, which is almost a soft sell, right? But real rage, whether that was the rage that met the end of uh, enslavement, right? The Reconstruction era met with intense hatred and the resurrection of really slave-like, slavery-like conditions for African-American folk throughout the South, a vicious resurgence of white supremacy culminating, of course, in Jim Crow laws. Uh, when, the, when the Great Migration takes place and you have black folks moving north, to escape conditions in the South, they are met with a right, significant rage in the Midwest and the Northeast and the industrial corridors of this country, overt racial pogroms, we call them race riots, but that doesn't do it justice, right? Racial pogroms, orgies of violence that meet these migrants looking for work, right? Again, some themes repeat themselves over and over in our history as we see right now with the way that we treat migrant labor as well. White rage that met the Brown versus Board of Education decision, a kind of rage that led entire school districts to simply shut down their public schools in the South, create white flight so-called Christian academies where the white folks could go and end black schools or black schooling after fifth grade or seventh grade or eighth grade. It was a form of real rage. We saw it culminate not only in the South in places like Boston, right? And there were desegregation crises out here, as you well know. And so, right, West Coast, East, South, all around the country, that kind of rage which met progress. And of course, then that culminates even beyond the desegregation backlash with the response to affirmative action, the response to the Fair Housing Act, all kinds of backlash that we saw throughout the 80s. And then, of course, with the advances signified or symbolized by the presidency of Barack Obama, you get birtherism, you get the Tea Party, you get this I want my country back mentality, putting aside how concrete the gains for black and brown folks really were in the years of the Obama administration, and we can debate that. I personally think there's a lot, of course, that was left on the table, so to speak. I don't put that on him. I put that on us and him, all of us together. Had to do more, didn't do enough. But the point is, it certainly was symbolic of advance. It was symbolic of progress, and it was met with the same kind of rage. And so what we're seeing with Trumpism is what we saw in the 60s and the early 70s. It's what we saw in the 1920s and the 1930s. It's what we saw in the 1890s, the 1870s, the 1880s, even some of the same rhetoric, right? The rhetoric of white victimhood, right? The idea that we're the ones now, that's what all the surveys say, white folks are locked in this not only nostalgia for the past, but this real fear that we're the ones being victimized. Not only the polls tell us that, YouTube tells us, right? Because you can get on YouTube and you can see videos of some of these folks, right? This one guy, you saw him in the Starbucks. This white man melted down in a Starbucks, yelled at a black barista, called her everything but a child of God, used every possible racial slur, pointed out, I voted for Trump, like that was at all relevant to his latte purchase, right? 
but he apparently got bad service and wanted to let everybody know that, by God, I'm a Trump voter and you're a, and he uses the N-word, and it's all on video. And his point was that he feels oppressed because he got bad service at the Starbucks. Y'all, if, uh, if you think that bad service at the Starbucks, like they put soy milk in and you ask for 2%, like if you think that that is oppression, you have just proven white privilege with a vengeance. Better than me or my books or Carol Anderson or her books or any person of color ever possibly could. Because if you think that's oppression, you don't know what oppression is. So thank you for the assist, you know, in the pedagogical approach of what I'm trying to do. And there was the white woman in the Michaels in Chicago, right? Bought too much stuff to fit into the plastic bags that they give you. And so the black woman who was the clerk said, hey, we've got these you know, reusable, recyclable bags. It'll just be a dollar. Your stuff will fit in there better. And she goes ballistic, starts using racial slurs at her. Again, talks about being a Trump voter, like it's relevant to her crafting or whatever she was doing with the stuff from Michaels. Once again, thinking that she's oppressed because they asked her to buy a $1 bag, y'all. A $1 bag was oppression. See, this is what Robin D'Angelo talks about is white fragility, right? This idea that we're just sort of like, and it's funny because these are the people that call progressive snowflakes, right? These are the people that, those of us who fight racism, well, you're snowflakes because you can't handle what? Like you get triggered too easily. You think everything is racism. So we're the snowflakes. This coming from people who sort of lost their mind when they redid Annie with a black character, right? These are... You know, they redid Annie with a black actress and Jamie Foxx. And it was like, you can't redo Annie. It's a classic. She's an orphan and she has red hair. You know, and then they made Rue black in the Hunger Games. And we're like, oh, no, no, no. You can't do that. So, you know, sort of interesting when you call someone a snowflake and you melt that easily. But that's sort of where white rage is. It's gotten to this absurdity, but it's always been there. It was Justice Joseph Bradley of the Supreme Court in 1883 who first coined the concept of sort of reverse discrimination against white people when he, along with his colleagues, threw out many of the Reconstruction era civil rights laws by saying that it was time for the Negro to stop being the special favorite of the law and join the rest of us as mere citizens, right? This is sort of ironic considering that up until a few years before, only whites could be citizens and were considered as such, but now all that special treatment, you know, the Freedmen's Bureau, which lasted about a minute, and the Freedmen's Bank, which lasted about another minute, was too much favoritism. So again, this stuff has been around, and I want us to remember that because folks fought that then, and we don't have to be disheartened now. It's really not a unique moment. It just goes to show that, you know, as I think we might all know, Donald Trump didn't really think of something new, right? This isn't, this isn't, this isn't some new stuff, right? It's a lot easier to fight the monster when you've seen him before. That's all I'm saying. The third thing that Trumpism is predicated on is this long-standing divide and conquer thing. Now, I think I probably talked about this last time I was here, and I was actually, I looked at the video this morning, because I don't, I don't want to repeat myself, but then Albert, my buddy, you know, he says to me, uh, you know, Tim, when the Stones play, they still do satisfaction. So, <laughs> so I was like, okay. All right, well, I'm not Mick Jagger, and y'all ain't paying me like the Stones, but... But, uh, but if I did repeat this, if I am being repetitive here, it's because it's an important, it's an important tune and an important note to, to hit, right? Um, you know, the history of the country is the history of rich white men telling not rich white people that their enemies are black and brown. I mean, that's America sort of in a nutshell when it comes to race and class, right? If you had to put, uh, I don't know, it may be too many syllables for a haiku, but you know, it's like basically, if you had to come up with a very short phrase um, that you could, I don't know, maybe too long for a bumper sticker also, but it's the history of America uh, is the history of rich white men telling not rich white people that their enemies are black and brown. It begins in the colonial period, right, when whiteness wasn't even a thing yet. There was no white race. We didn't love each other. We spent most of our time in Europe killing each other. The English hated the Irish. The Irish hated them back. Northern Italians didn't consider Southern Italians to even be Italians. Right? The Germans hated everyone, and the feeling was quite often mutual. Right? I mean, the history of Europe was sort of the history of killing one another and looking for the witch, alternately. That was the other thing we did a lot. We didn't consider ourselves one big happy family. 
But all of a sudden, in the middle of the 1700s, there becomes a need for this thing called the white race. Well, what changed, right? What changed was rich folks looked around, started counting, and realized they were heavily outnumbered. When you take African enslaved folks, European indentured servants, just one level above enslavement, when you look at other peasants in the European group who maybe weren't indentured, you put them together, they outnumber the elite, right? You had a handful of folks that owned all the stuff, and everybody else working for them, see, some things really don't change. 400 years on, we're back to that, right? And so they looked around and realized they had to figure out a way to get some of those poor Europeans on their team. They create the notion of whiteness, the white race, give out little perks here and there. You can enter into contracts, testify in court. You can vote at least if you're male. We're going to put you on the slave patrol to keep those people in line, right? It's not real power. You know, you're on the slave patrol. You don't own the land, right? You know, and this is important in, in an era of police misconduct in our country to understand. This is the bright line of the first iteration of law enforcement was slave patrol, right? And black and brown folks know that. See, knowing your history is really important because I gather that a lot of white Americans don't know that history that stretches from slave patrols to the present. And if you don't understand that and you don't understand the way in which black life has been discounted so regularly, then a phrase like, let alone a movement like Black Lives Matter won't make sense to you, right? And then you'll say things like, well, but what about my life? But all lives matter, don't I? But what about me? I know all lives matter, precious. I know. I know. I got, I got two white children. I know. You don't have to tell me that their lives matter. The problem is every police officer in America knows already. And every teacher in America knows. And every employer knows. And every bank loan officer knows that their lives matter and that their credit record probably won't. See, that's the difference. Right? But if you don't know the history, including the slave patrol history all the way up to the present, lots of misconduct in the Los Angeles area. If you don't know enough about it, just watch. I think it was episode two of the five-part OJ documentary on ESPN. You'll know all you need to know about the history of the LAPD. And it'll put everything in perspective for you if you didn't already know. Right? Now, you, you know, could have just asked some black folks and they would have told you. Could have just asked some Latinx folks and they would have told you. But a lot of times we just don't know this stuff because we haven't been taught. Not your fault. Right? I wasn't taught it. I took AP history. That's the history for smart people. <laughs> and they still didn't teach me about that. So you can't know what you weren't taught. You can't teach what you don't know. So anyway, the divide and conquer starts in the 1700s. And all of a sudden, the cross-racial rebellions that had begun to foment begin not to foment, begin to diminish, and whiteness becomes stronger. The Civil War era is the same thing. You got rich white folks telling poor white folks that they got to go out and fight because the rich don't fight. <laughs> the rich aren't going to fight to keep their own property interest in other human beings. They're going to get poor people to do that. Rich people, if y'all aren't clear on this, don't fight wars. They get poor people to do the dirty work for them. They get doctors to write notes saying they have heel spurs and can't go to Vietnam. That's what rich people do. And if y'all don't know who I'm talking about, you can just Google that. That's what the Internet is for, y'all. Um, so they get these poor folks to go fight. But why would you do that if you are poor, man? I'm telling you that the reason the war needs to happen is to maintain my property interest in slaves, because you do know we were real transparent about that 150 years ago. We're embarrassed now, so we lie. Oh, it's not about that. You know, it was about some sorghum gravy recipe or something. It was states' rights, and, and it was just we just wanted small government, you know, whatever. I mean. You know, Jefferson Davis threatened to shoot women in Richmond who were protesting his government. That's how much they believed in small government and uh, the people. But, you know, that's something we say now. 150 years ago, the Southern elite were very clear that it was about white supremacy. Alexander Stevens said that was the cornerstone of the Confederate government. So we talked about it, but how do you get poor folks who don't even own a human being, right, to go out and fight? Well, you do it by telling them if you don't fight and they get their freedom, they're going to take your job. But they already had the job. That's the point, because if I got to charge you a dollar a day to work on your farm and you can get that guy over there to do it for free or that woman over there to do it for free because you own them, guess who got the gig? Free got the gig. People like free, right? And so ultimately the working class, quote unquote, white person, their labor was underbid right, by the enslavement system. They'd have been better off sticking it out with black folks to overthrow that system, but the psychological wage of whiteness said, forget all that, cash this check. Labor union movement, same thing. Labor union leaders, right, who aren't even the elite, they're just the elite within the labor struggle, saying things like, well, you know, we can't integrate the union, it'll reduce the professionalism of our craft. No, it will double your union. 
And then when y'all go out on strike, the boss can't hire the black folks, the Latinx folks, and the Asian American folks to replace you. And that's what they're going to do if you don't bring them in. They're going to replace you with the very people you thought you were better than, and then you'll get mad at who? Them, not the boss. Divide and conquer. So are we really surprised that this continues to work? Right? Are we really surprised when a politician says, we got to build this wall right here because that's why y'all don't have jobs. We build a wall, all the jobs will come back. For real? You think that's how capitalism works? <laughs> you think capitalists of America are sitting around going, man, I hope they don't figure out this thing about the wall because uh, if they just figure out to build a wall, we're going to have to give everybody a raise. That's not how capitalism works. Capital will always jump borders in search of the highest rate of return. Goods will always cross borders in search of the highest price. If you allow capital to cross and goods to cross, but you don't let labor cross in search of the highest wage, you inherently tilt the game against working people north and south of that border. So once again, working class folks in this country, white, black, and otherwise, would be better off to have a larger and more militant working class, right? But you build that wall and you choke off the prospects of that altogether. This isn't why folks don't have Work, I, I did get, you know, I get emails like that though. This young man writes to me and says, I can't find a job because blacks and Mexicans are taking them all. Really, all, all the jobs, they're taking all of the jobs. Where exactly are they taking them, right? People of color twice as likely to be unemployed. It's like if they are taking them, they're taking them like a block and then they're like, yeah, done with that, no. Every time I hear that, I have this image in my head of some dairy farmer in Iowa Wakes up 4.30 in the morning, time to milk the cows, time to milk the cows. Walks out to the barn to milk the cows, looks around and goes, well, I'll be damned, these cows have already been milked. Who did that? Right? And then some black guy pops up from around the side of the barn. It's me, Andre from Detroit. I did that. I took your job. And then the farmer's like, you know. I mean, it's absurd, right? But we have, I mean, the more you think about it, the more absurd it is. That's why it's sort of funny, but it's just this idea, right, that these people took my stuff. Now, of course, there are no Mexican folk that were responsible for, documented or not, that were responsible for the meltdown on Wall Street, right? But Divide and Conquer says we don't look at them. Divide and Conquer says we look at the people at the very bottom of that system, right? Or we say things like, well, you know, Mexico's not sending their best. Like England sent their best, right? <laughs> right? Like, I think it's relatively axiomatic that the best never leave, right? Like, like, by definition, the ones who are winning don't get on the boat, right? It's only the losers who get on the boat. Why would you get on the boat if you were winning? Why would you? You wouldn't. You would stay right where you are, right? It's only the, and there's nothing wrong, by the way, with being the loser who either gets on the boat or crosses that border. The difference is when you forget how you got here. Right? See, black folks know how they got here, and indigenous people know their, how they got here and were here first, and Latinx people know because they are indigenous, let us not forget, though we try to encourage them to forget. They know that they were here long before most of the rest of us were. It's only some of us from Europe that have this mythology, well, we came for freedom, and they're coming for stuff. Yo, we came for stuff. We came for land. We, even, even liberty is, is some stuff that you didn't have in the other place. But if you divide yourself from other people, right, then it's impossible to see yourself in them and to see them in you. Here's why this is not just an academic point, And then I'm going to be done and take some questions. Um, and this is something I know I talked about last time. And Ed actually talked about it in the service before I spoke um, because it had just come out in the news. But it's really especially relevant now. So you remember, if you were here last time, we talked about that research that had found this interesting and to some inexplicable spike in death rates among working class white folks, middle-aged, non-college educated white folks, disproportionately from suicide, opioid addiction, or cirrhosis of the liver brought on by heavy drinking. And it was the only subgroup between 1999 and 2013 that saw a spike in mortality, right? Black mortality continued to drop, Latinx mortality continued to drop, um, but this one group, right, saw this spike, 200 to 300,000 excess deaths relative to what should have happened had the other trends continued before 99. And so you start to wonder why, why would this be the group? Well, they call these things in the paper, if you follow it, deaths of despair, right? 
that these are folks, especially the opioid crisis, which it's sort of odd that we call it that, right? Because there was an opioid crisis in the 70s that was disproportionately black, brown, and urban, and we didn't call it that. We called people junkies. We did not counsel rehabilitation. We threw them in prison. We did the same thing in the 80s with the crack epidemic. We didn't counsel rehab, counseling, or education, or any form of forbearance. We just locked people away. Now that it's salt of the earth, white folks in small towns, my God, we have, must help these people. Well, absolutely. I mean, there's no, no doubt to that. We're just about 40 years too late to having that empathy and compassion. But anyway, right, the interesting thing about this spiral in these deaths of despair, once again, these aren't necessarily the people in the most pain, right? And I'm not trying to minimize their pain, but again, objectively, every economic and social well-being indicator says that black and brown folks are overwhelmingly worse off. But these are folks who, because of that expectationalism that I referenced before, got to grow up in a society saying, that won't happen to me. See, if you tell folks that all you gotta do is work hard and everything will work out. See, if you're a person of color, you know it's never been that simple, right? Black and brown folks know that that's a myth on a good day, right? People of color know they've worked hard all their lives, often have nothing to show for it. The only group in America that's really had the luxury of believing that myth, and not all of us have, but the only one that could have, to any real extent, have been white folks, even working class white folks. Because if I'm a working class white guy, historically, is this not true? I've always had the luxury of at least believing in horizontal mobility, which is, what is that? That's my granddaddy worked in the mine, my daddy worked in the mine, I work in the mine, my son's gonna work in the mine, right? As long as, you're, have, as, long as you have a strong back and can lift stuff, as the old saying goes, you'll always have work. Once again, no person of color ever took that for granted. But a lot of white folks, particularly white working class men did, and then when all of a sudden the economy shifts under their feet, right? And the jobs are no longer there because of economic trends that they have no control over, when all of a sudden the, the guy that operates the coal mine figures out it's cheaper to just blow the top off the mountain with dynamite, right? That doesn't take as many workers. You don't have to get as many miners down there when you can just blow the top off the mountain and get the coal out that way. It's not, the, it's not environmentalists, it's not hippies that make the coal industry go away, right? It's rich white dudes who themselves never worked in a mine but own one, right? And yet, if I'm not prepared, right, if I'm not ready for setback because generally I haven't faced it or maybe I have but I always had the hope, right, the belief that my kids, they'll be better off than than I was, just like I was better off than my folks, just like my folks were better off than my grandfolks. That trajectory held for a lot of history for the vast majority of white folks. It still holds, I would say, for most, but for this group, right, for whom it doesn't, it's like, oh, no, no, you told me that I was going to have a seven or better on the scale of life if I just played by the rules, and I'm only at a five and a half, and I'm 45 years old staring down retirement here in about 20 years. What am I going to do, right? I guess what I'm trying to say is white folks should have been listening to people of color all along because if we had, we would have known that the system was rigged, see? We would have known that the system was a scam, that it was a fraud, that it was a hoax, and maybe then we could have joined in solidarity with people of color to change that system rather than falling for the divide and conquer because the divide and conquer now, it's not just that it takes people away from recognizing their class interest which obviously is no great shakes to them. They don't really think about that, right? It's not just that, it's that identifying with whiteness and the expectationalism that comes with it is literally killing folks because they don't have the coping skills to deal with setback. It's something James Baldwin wrote about and I did quote him last time, same quote, but I will do it again because this is, one, this is, this is satisfaction, not what I said. This is, this is the Mick Jagger moment whenever I quote James Baldwin. This is what Baldwin said, he was writing about black folks and the ability of people of color to overcome obstacles and the inability sometimes of the dominant group to do it. He said the following, he said, I don't mean to romanticize suffering, but that person who can never suffer can never grow up. That man who has to snatch his manhood out of the fires of human cruelty that rage to destroy it every day, learn something about himself in the process that no school and no church on earth can teach, and that is a sense of his own authority, and that is unshakable because in order to save his life, he has to constantly figure out the meaning behind the words. Right? When a person is constantly having to survive the worst that life can bring, they cease to be afraid of the worst that life can bring. See, folks of color ain't scared in this country right now. Are they concerned? Yes. Are they disturbed? Yes. But are they afraid? Absolutely they are not because they have seen this movie before, right? And they know that that movie doesn't end until we say that it ends. And if you haven't had a chance to go to that museum in DC, please do it. 
it will restore you, right? You will see the images. You will see Nat Turner's Bible. You will see Emmett Till's original casket. You will see the images of all those who came before this administration and tried, tried, tried to destroy the spark of liberty and freedom and justice that is always burned in black and brown folks' breasts and souls and minds and have failed to do so. And like I said, if you come out of there and you're still worried about this moment and this man and this presidency, you need to go back through again and pay a little bit closer attention because at the end of the day, we're the ones who will make America great. Not again, but for the very first time. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you. So as is my way, I talk too long. Um, but uh, I do want to take a couple questions real quickly and then uh, talk to you out back uh, for a second as well. Yes, yes, yes. Whoever's got the mic, we will get it to you. Um, but you got to move quick because we're running out of time. They're on. You just got to speak and it'll work probably. Yeah. Yes, my name is David. Uh, what levers of power, what mechanisms do you see as most effective in blurring the lines and eliminating the, the line separating or uh, allowing people that are in a, a less privileged position mm -hmm. to gain more power? Is it greater access to education and higher education? Is it? Well, I think it's certainly important. The problem with greater access to education and higher ed is that, you know, you can have a very well-funded apartheid educational system you can have a very well-funded apartheid healthcare system. I think a lot of times what we do is we look at systems that we wanna make better and we think, well, if we could just have a program to deal with this or some money to deal with, and money matters, don't get me wrong, but I think the problem in our schools is not just that we don't have the resources to make things more equitable, it's that we don't have the pedagogical approach, the curriculum, or the necessary mentality to make things equitable. As I tell teachers all the time, this school system was set up to be unequal. It's not an accident. It's like, you know, if you, if you think it's if you think it's just a matter of more money or this, that, and the other, you're missing the point. It's like if you're at the if you're in a sausage factory and you're standing at the end of the conveyor belt and it keeps giving you sausage and you're wondering why you didn't get chicken nuggets, you clearly didn't read the sign. It's a sausage factory. So it's gonna keep giving you sausage until you retool the machine. And I think the problem is that we act sometimes, even the most progressive of us, like the system is failing. How do we make the system work? No, the system's working, y'all. That's the problem. The system is doing exactly what it was intended to do. So the levers that we've got to, to, to manipulate are the ones that literally change our mindset about what the purpose of schooling is. Is the purpose of schooling just to help you get a job in, a, in, a, in an economy that's going to keep you vulnerable probably for the vast majority of your life? Or is the purpose of education to fundamentally transform the social structures and create greater equity for all? And I think that's a mentality that we've got to have that's as, as important, if not more so, than the money. Next question, please. Yes. Yes. Uh, Frank Rich wrote an article in New York Magazine uh, recently. I don't know if you saw it, mm -hmm. but his premise was to uh, progressives don't worry about feeling empathy for the Trump yeah. voter. Just get mad and get to work. Right. And um, I, a lot of the points were the same as you're making about yeah. these people that are really not able to act in their own interest. Do you have right. anything to add to that? Well, here's the thing. I, you know, I, he makes a lot of really good points in the piece. I, I still think empathy is valuable, but it has to be reciprocal, right? In other words, I am more than willing to empathize with another who's in pain uh, because that pain of the class system is very real. Um, but I'm not going to empathize with you if you are not willing to empathize with those who you have demeaned and continue to demean. If we're going to say, well, when we're out of work, it's, it's, it's a crisis, but when they're out of work, it's because they're lazy. That's not reciprocation, right? So A, we need it to be reciprocal, and B, even if I empathize with you, I'm not going to indulge your ridiculous diagnosis of your pain. It's like, look, if I, if I wake up and go, oh my, I've got a pain in my side, I need to Google that, I'm sure it must be cancer, don't indulge my ridiculousness. Pull the plug, shut down the computer, tell me to go to a real doctor rather than coming up with my own diagnosis of the problem. Have empathy, because maybe I'm really hurting, but the odds of it being something serious rather than a pulled muscle are pretty thin. And so I, I believe in empathy because the pain is real, but I think it has to be reciprocal and, and, and we have to insist that people are willing to at least consider 
the possibility that the reason they are in pain is because they have not acted in solidarity with people of color. Because see, if, if we'd acted in solidarity with people of color, the whole concept of the public good wouldn't have been uh, uh, eradicated in this country, but it has. The reason we're angry at government intervention in the economy to help people is because for 45 years we've racialized government intervention in the economy to help people. And so we've convinced folks, the only folks we do that for are those people over there, and now you got millions of white folks that need it and can't get it because we have demonized the very things that they need. And if they're not willing to at least consider that, I mean, my thing is, look, I I, I'm going to, you know, by God, I'm going to love them enough to make sure that even the most ridiculous Trump supporter gets health care and, and, and food and shelter, because I believe those are human rights. So I'm just going to have to force you to like it, I guess. Um, but, but, but will I work with people? Yeah, I'll work with folks if they're willing to reciprocate and if they're willing to acknowledge that they have been played for fools, because we all get played for fools sometimes. There's no shame in that. You just got to own it. Next question real quick. Okay. Oh, whoever wants it. Right here. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, I never heard that this is my check. My stand. Yeah. Um, the question I have is, you had mentioned early on in your, your talk about uh, the silver lining that you tell your daughters or that you've been. Could you repeat that, please? Because, uh, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm so, no. I, you know. Right. You. The one that I, that I mentioned, obviously, is that sometimes the, when things become more obvious, Right. Although that's a horrible thing. We're seeing an uptick in overt racism. We're seeing an uptick in overt hostility. We're seeing ice raids. We're seeing the Justice Department saying they're prepared to essentially turn police loose with very little accountability and do more stop and frisk and profiling. On the one hand, that's all horrific. Right. The only silver lining in that is that at least now we for some we won't have to do the 101. The part that says, no, really, there's still a race problem. In fact, there was a survey that came out yesterday that found a much larger percentage than had been true a few years ago of people saying that, you know, race relations are at a crisis point. Now, they don't necessarily mean by that what I mean by that, but the fact that people are, are talking about it, they're paying attention to it, the tension is palpable, gives us, if we are prepared to take advantage of that horrific thing, uh, gives us a tool that we didn't have in the Obama years. In the Obama years, the tool was we were having to fight sort of colorblind formalism, right? The idea that the less we talk about it, the less we think about it, the better because everything's sort of resolving itself. Now we don't have the luxury of that and I think there are people who maybe fell into colorblind formalism in the last eight years who now have been woken up, right? If you saw, for those of you who saw the SNL sketch right after the election, this is a good place to close. It's a brilliant sketch. If you haven't seen it, you should look it up. So and it sort of encapsulates what I'm saying, right? There's, there's four white folks in their Brooklyn apartment, which is appropriate for a million different reasons. But anyway, four white folks, and they got their one black friend at the time who's there, uh, who's Dave Chappelle, who's come back for the show, right? And, and so he's sitting there, and they're all, they're all like, well, I, we just know that Hillary Clinton is going to win. It's going to be a historic night, you know? And, and Chappelle's character goes, yeah, it's going to be a long night, all right? And uh, and they go, you know, and they're waiting, they're all excited, and, and all of a sudden the returns start to come in, and they're not what they expect, at least they're not what they expect. Dave Chappelle apparently not shocked at all because people of color sort of knew this was quite possible, and they're all sitting around. One of them says, well, you know, Vermont is still out, and Chappelle says, oh, snap, Vermont with their four electoral college votes, you know. <laughs> And, and then when it ends, they're all crestfallen. They're like, oh, my God, you know, this is the most racist thing that's ever happened in America. And at this point, Chris Rock has come and joined the party. And, and, and he goes, really, the most racist thing that ever happened in America? And he goes, and then Chappelle says, yeah, you know, my, my great granddaddy used to tell me something about this. But what did he know? He was a slave, right? The whole point, the whole point of this bit, right, is to say that now y'all see, right? Now some of y'all see what we see. And I gotta tell you, anything that allows, even if it's not most, even if it's just a bigger chunk of white America to see what people of color have always seen is a good thing, so far as I'm concerned, because it's the inability, it's the myopia of whiteness that has generally been one of our biggest Achilles heels. So I think that is, if there is silver lining, that's it, but it won't mean anything unless we go out and take advantage of that moment. Thank you all so much, appreciate it. Thank you, Tim.